next few weeks. Okay, number 234, I Know Whom I Have Believed. Sing it out. Number 234 in the song. Sure glad to see you this evening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Fred, could I ask you to step to the mic there? Can we get that one turned on, Josiah? Go right ahead, Brother Fred. Our Heavenly Father, it's a great joy to be here this evening. It's good to be with God's people. It's good to be with the, the place where you uh, speak to us in a very special way. Pray that you'll bless our pastor with power of the Holy Spirit and speak to our hearts. Challenge us, Lord, with what you have for us this week. We'll thank you for the results in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a seat, would you please? Let me share with you a few announcements. First of all, don't forget, if you were on Team Hank during our spring campaign, we need you to sign up this evening in the lobby so that we are sure to have a meal for you next Sunday evening. Uh, part of the contest was the winning team would get a catered dinner, barbecue dinner, okay? And so that's going to happen next Sunday night after church. But we need to get a head count on who to expect for that. So help us with that, would you please? I need to meet with all those folks who signed up to be involved in Vacation Bible School. Or if you're interested in being involved in Vacation Bible School, we'll have a brief meeting this evening. We'll go through some of our assignments of where we're serving and how you can help us. And so tonight I'll remind you when we dismiss regarding that. If you have teenagers who are interested in attending youth conference, this is something we've done for many years. We find it to be helpful for the young people. If you'd like to know more about that, Brother Anthony would like to meet with you this evening, okay? And so if you're a teen and or parent of a teen and you'll be meeting where, Brother Anthony? The old teen area will be fine? All right, we'll have you meet in the teen room, okay? If that's something you'd like to know more about, we'd be glad for you to get that information, okay? We've had a great weekend so far. We had a good day. It's a, it's a busy weekend. We have folks traveling and coming and going, and we had guests today, people passing through, and we're glad for that. We have guests back tonight with us. We're 
honored by your presence here with us this evening. And I'm believing that the Lord's going to give us a good time in the Lord's house tonight. And then I think we're having chocolate and vanilla. All right. And is it ready to go? Not yet. It will be. All right. Chocolate and vanilla and the soft serve. And that is, I think it's, uh, what did I tell you? It's like lactose free or something like that. So what is it? It's lactose free. Lactose free. All right. So how many of you have problems like that? All right, we, all right, we're taking care of you. We're looking out for you. What can I say? It's nothing real about the ice cream at all, but it tastes good. All right, and so, uh, we'll, but you know, it's free. There you go. And so, well, I guess not really, really free is that somebody had to pay for it, but uh, we'll enjoy that this evening afterwards. Brother Graham has an activity plan for the children that would like to stick around and be involved in that, and it's kickball. Did I get that right, or is it dodgeball? Dodgeball, okay. How many of you remember the good old sport of dodgeball back before political correctness? Uh, back when you were, it was okay to lob a ball at somebody's head. It was all part of the fun of things, right? Yeah. I did that one time in high school and lobbed a ball across the gym and hit my grammar teacher right in the head. Knocked her down three steps. Haven't played since. I'm not going to play tonight either. I learned my lesson very quickly. It was an unintended consequence. It was not what I expected it to become, all right? Not one of my better moments, I'll tell you that for sure. And she still remembers me. How can you forget the guy that knocks you down the steps of the volleyball, okay? So, uh, anyhow, they'll have a good time with that. And again, please be mindful of that. Hey, this Saturday, we're going to have a Super Saturday. And so what that means uh, is we're going to meet on Saturday morning for breakfast at 10 o'clock. And then after we eat some breakfast together, we're going to go out in a systematic fashion and do, go out and knock doors and be involved in canvassing and witnessing. And we'll meet you at whatever level you're at. If you're comfortable hanging door hangers, you can hang door hangers. If you want to talk to folks, you can do that. We've started teen soul winning up here over the summer months. With, uh, on Thursdays, we have a bit of a training time. And this past week, we had nearly 30 teenagers who were out for a couple of hours taking the gospel into the neighborhoods around the church and being given an opportunity to witness. We're so happy about that. If you have teens and that's something that you'd like to know more about, we'd be glad for them to be involved in that as well. Okay, that's it for me. Choir, go right ahead.
now. Let's stand together and sing number 531, Now I Belong to Jesus. What a good song. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. Come in the power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. shake hands uh, for a minute. Find your seat, would you please, and remain standing and take your Bibles out tonight and turn with me to the book of Matthew, please. We're going to go to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 12, please, Matthew chapter 12. And I want you this evening to look with me as we'll begin reading here in just a moment of verse 39 of Matthew chapter 12. This is an interesting portion of Scripture for sure, and there are several things that I'd like to bring out to you this evening, and then also 
uh, try to make some application for us. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 39, but he answered and said unto them, and this he would be Jesus, but Jesus answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Notice verse 41, please. The men of Nineveh shall rise up, shall rise rather in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Notice verse 43, and this is connected here, and we'll seek to make some understanding here in a few moments. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. And I think the key word there is the word empty. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. You remember that the Lord entered into that conversation by saying, if you remember verse 39, but he answered and said unto them, an evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And now he describes this generation, even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. There's some very powerful statements that are made here. There's a lot of doctrine in this portion of Scripture too, and I, there's no way to unbox it all this evening. We're given insight into several areas. For one thing, we're given insight into future judgment and how Nineveh and this particular queen that are referenced are going to rise up, and evidently in, in that judgment, and that's a general judgment, there'll be folks to condemn or to speak out. There'll be a testifying, so to speak, or a position in that and the, the Bible says that the people of Nineveh in that generation of Jesus' day will speak against them. They're going to say to this effect, hey, we had Jonah, you had Jesus. But all Jonah had to say was basically eight words, and we repented, and you're not even getting it that Jesus, God, is in your midst. And that's a powerful statement. And then said about wisdom. So the first thing was repentance, and the second thing is wisdom. That this queen traveled all this way to get wisdom from Solomon. And Solomon doesn't compare to Jesus. I want to speak to this evening. I know it's the, it's the 4th of July weekend, and I've been thinking about some things uh, regarding our nation, and I, I'll try to surmise it. I, I know where I want to go. I just don't know how I'm going to get there just yet, but I think we'll figure it out. But how do we end up here? How does a nation that has such a heritage of God has such a heritage of trusting God, and it's so obvious the providence and the blessing of God on our nation. How did we end up having an entire month last month celebrated by the Sodomites? How do we end up now divided in the streets with people fighting over whether or not we murder babies? Why do we make such statements as protect children and then in our schools we turn people loose to bring them into all sorts of debauchery and immoral behavior. How, how did we get here? It's like we're schizophrenic. We're flaking out. How do we end up with a judge sitting on the highest uh, court in the land who when asked to give their definition of a woman could not even give a, would not, for fear of offense or for fear simply of being misunderstood or whatever, or simply because she's not a biologist. Couldn't even preface her response with, in my opinion, a woman. How are, you going to, how, how are you going to interpret law when you can't even give me a clear, distinct answer of what a, who a woman is? How did we get here? How do we get here from putting our hand over our heart and pledging and being thankful and God we trust? And How did we get here? I think I'm going to show you this evening. And and I want you to understand some things. There is hope in this, but there's also truth, and there's a reality of some things, too, to be seen here in the Scripture. 
And uh, I, I believe uh, that just in, uh, you and I would stand in this generation, there was a generation in Israel that stood and would eventually watch again as their temple and other things take place and they are decimated again, where they too would have to admit, boy, we, were, we missed it. We missed it. And I believe the Lord will use this tonight in our hearts. I, I hope that he will. And we'll go to the Lord in prayer now. Father in heaven, we desire to hear from you. Lord, it is my desire to feed your people and also to help them to understand the word of God. But Lord, also to give just some understanding of where we're at and how we got here and what can we do and what should we do while we're here and what's the answer. Lord, this is not to, to be a, a, a downer or to, to cause us to not be cheerful because we have the utmost hope and help in Christ. It's to be realist. It's to recognize where real hope is and to go to the truth. And also, Lord, to arm ourselves with truth. To be prepared to stand as you have given us in Ephesians dealing with spiritual warfare. To put on the whole armor of God. It's for real. And there's a lot of things happening. Lord, and our young people, they need to wake up. They need to be alive. And they need to, they're, they're, they just need to hit the ground running. Please, Lord, help us now and help me. Give me wisdom, Lord, to give the uh, truth and the word of God in such a way that it would be understandable. Lord, also applicable. But, Lord... Guide my thoughts and guide my heart and help me now, Lord. And we'll certainly thank you for it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat, would you please? Brother Gray, you sing. Could it be that up in heaven God is sitting on his throne Anticipating another sinner Would soon become his own Years of wasted living And years of toil and strife Are just about to be over As he receives the gift of life Go sound the horn Strike up the choir, a sinner is saved, saved from the fire, no more in darkness, he's received my son, all heaven rejoices, that's the value of one. The Holy Spirit has been working to soften up a heart. All he needs is a willing servant to simply do their part. Can you imagine up in heaven the joy there'll be that day when a sinner bows his head to pray? Can you hear the Father say, Go sound the horn? Strike up the choir, a sinner is saved, saved from the fire. No more in darkness, he's received my son. All heaven rejoices, that's the value of one. Start construction on his mansion, there on Hallelujah Street. He doesn't know yet that it's waiting when the Savior he will meet. He'll meet. Go sound the horn, strike up the choir. A sinner is saved, saved from the fire. No more in darkness, he's received my son. All oh, heaven rejoices, that's the value of one. All oh, heaven rejoices, all oh, heaven rejoices, all oh, heaven rejoices. That's the value of one, the value of one. Great song. Thank you, Brother Gray. Hey, look at me, if you would, please, in your Bibles again. We've gone to the book of Matthew, and we're going to, if time will allow, turn to some other places this evening. 
But uh, we're starting out here to Matthew chapter 12. Let me pray briefly and we'll start. Father, now bless this time. Use it in each of our lives. We ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a generation Jesus was in. And of course, contextually, he's dealing with the Pharisees in this entire chapter. There have been all sorts of allegations against Jesus. They have uh, accused him of casting out devils and being empowered by the devil himself. And how insulting is that? Uh, just on the surface face value of it, but really just to listen to that, to not to give God the glory and the power of God, the credit, but to, but to credit the devil with this. And uh, Jesus is dealing with them throughout this chapter. And we, we spent some time on Wednesday evenings a while back looking at the life of Christ chronologically, and we tracked the different groups of people and their responses to Christ. And this particular group that he's dealing with here, they're a crowd that are, have become external They've become about how they appear and their appearance to others. And this is where they're at. And so there is a form of godliness, but there's an emptiness. There's an emptiness. And the Lord Jesus rebukes them. And he mentions, and we've emphasized it for just a few moments already, that Nineveh, and what a wicked city Nineveh was. Think in the Bible of cities that God pronounced judgment on and, and destroyed and wiped that city out. And it's a, there's a, a list, but it's not a very long list. But Nineveh was one of them. Nineveh was so corrupt and so debased that God was going to wipe them out. But God was gracious and He sent them a prophet. He sent them Jonah. And uh, the Bible gives us here insight into that. I believe, as you should believe, that Jonah was put into the belly of a whale and he was there for three days and three nights. You know why it's so important? Because Jesus said it. And Jesus said that it was a sign. Now some folks believe that Jonah died in the belly of the whale, and I understand where they're coming from. Some think that he sustained life, and then he came out. Some say that it was a sign of the resurrection even, that God would bring him back to life, that he was there in that, and God brought him back. Nonetheless, if he was simply alive and he came out that way, what would you look like ever after having been in the belly of a whale? There are people who have been in the belly of a whale and have sustained and been sustained there, but they've come out bleached in their skin. And I think probably at the very least when Jonah hit the ground running and came into Nineveh, they looked at him and said, what's wrong with this guy? And Jonah said, I got a message to tell you. I want to tell you something. He said it very, very, very concisely and very directly. You got 40 days. God's going to destroy this place. You need to repent. You need to get, get right with God, so to speak. This is the message. You know what they did? The Bible says from the greatest to the least, they repented. What would it take for America to repent? Uh, secularists, not even Bible believers or people who would even necessarily take the name of God made this comment over the past, the past uh, weeks, and that was this. Do you remember when pride was a sin? I mean, just the whole thought of pride was a sin. And now we're not only proud, but we've attached that to, a, to an attitude in an area of the utmost in the face of God. How do we go from our freedoms, people dying for them, for us to be able to be free to worship God and to live and to pursue a, a right direction in life? How have we become so warped that these freedoms are now used in such a derogatory fashion? How do we get there that we're debating whether or not preteens should be allowed to decide for themselves whether or not doctors begin to inject them with medications to keep them from going through puberty? What happened to us where we began to think that that was okay, that that's, you know, that, that's progressive thinking, that that's, you're, you're just off the scale if you don't agree with that? How did we get here? I'll tell you how we got here. A lack of repentance. We have seen all the signs of God. We've seen God's providence and God's blessing. We have watched in our country as God has developed and brought something, or birthed something here that is amazing. It stands out. You should put some time into world history. You should put some time into in investigating things to see what God has done here what we, with what we would call the American experiment. Not perfect. Issues that have been worked through, issues that are continuing to be worked through. 
You know, for example, the number one thing that people hang on America is slavery. I would remind you that slavery was not invented by America. I would remind you that hundreds of thousands of people gave their lives fighting, and one of the reasons was that issue. And I would remind you that even this evening, there are still people that are enslaved. There are countries in the world where people are still enslaved. If that is the besetting thing that hangs on us, they're not perfect. Problems? Yeah, sure. Struggling? Hey, anytime you bring a melting pot of people groups, people coming from different cultures and different ideologies, then that creates problems. And there's been division over the years. And hey, unbridled capitalism creates greed. And yet I'm thankful for capitalism. And you ought to be thankful for it also. It's because of capitalism that we have hospitals that compete against each other to further and to give better treatments. It's because of capitalism that people push themselves to invent things and to create things. Maybe they do it so they can get rich, but you're the benefactor of those things. Hey, there's a, a lot you might say, well, I wish that was different, but friend, I, I, the positives far away the negatives. When you look at this and you see what God has done and you see who God used to develop this and you see where we're at on the world stage, you can't help but see that the providence of God in raising up this nation. Do you know that at the top of the Washington Monument there is an inscription that honors God? 555 feet in the air, the founding fathers, and we can talk about the Freemasons at some other time, but there at the top of that monument, in Latin, there's an expression that honors God. This is our culture. It's our heritage. How did we get here? How did Israel and that generation that Jesus was with them, how did they miss it? First of all, they would not repent. They would not accept the truth. They would not come to God and, and deal with the truth between them and God. You know, very simply, there has to be a time in your life in this matter of salvation where you turn to God in salvation. Where you recognize that there is nobody but Jesus Christ that can save you. There was a something that took place in America in the late 1700s, mid-1700s. It was called the Great Awakening. America had grown very cold and indifferent to the gospel. The people had come over, the Puritans and the Pilgrims and various other groups had come. and They had things started, but America began to grow very cold. One of the problems was they had a lot of unconverted people who were attending their churches, and their churches were becoming dead. And God sent some men. He sent a fellow by the name of George Whitfield. He sent a fellow by the name of Jonathan Edwards and some others who came along and they began to preach the gospel. And the reality was there was a high percentage of the pastors at that time who weren't even saved. And people began to get saved. Those men would go and preach and factories would shut down and they would allow all the workers to come out and to listen to those men as they would stand in open air settings and they would preach the gospel and people would be saved. And it led on to something. It led to something called the Great Awakening. And it was based primarily on people getting born again, truly born again. Not just being religious. Not just having a form of something. But being in Christ and having Christ in them. Jesus said in that generation that he stood and he said, Nineveh will rise up in judgment of you because Nineveh listened to Jonah and Jonah gave him a simple message, and Jonah didn't have a good attitude. Jonah didn't come in love. Jonah came strictly out of the fact that God made him go, right? He even sat there, and he was mad that God spared Nineveh. He was angry about it. He cared more about the plant. Remember the story of Jonah? He cared more about the plant that shaded him and covered his head than he did the people who lived in Nineveh. And yet, even with that, they repented. Jesus said to his generation, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. I've loved you. I've gone about doing good. I've gone about healing your sick and helping your blind to see and your crippled to walk and I've proclaimed truth to you. And you still won't get it. Could I make a little application to our generation? 
Churches on every corner. Churches abound. The gospel all over radio, all over the television, all over the internet. Bible preaching and Bible teaching. A, a, a biblical heritage. And how hard-headed and hard-hearted are we towards God and towards really making things right in our lives or repenting and being concerned about sin. What's become of the church today, and I use that term very loosely. What's become of it that, that now even those who would hold a Bible in their hand would debate and be on differing opinions regarding abortion? Would be on differing opinions regarding sodomite behavior? Would even begin to make allowance and acceptance and put God's name on that? How do we get here? What have we got? Nineveh would rise up in judgment of that generation. What would Nineveh say to us? You have had the testimony of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. You've had the testimony and the authority of God's word. You've seen the blessing and the benefit of God's word. You have had the gospel saturate your shores and spread like wildfire across your nation and still? That's the gospel. Then the other thing is wisdom. If a queen, uninvited, would travel all that way to sit at the feet of Solomon, and we know who Solomon is. Don't mistake it. Solomon was given that opportunity. God said, what would you like to have? If I could grant you something, what would it be? He said, give me wisdom. So Solomon certainly had wisdom, but Solomon had some other issues, didn't he? Solomon was the one who came to the end of his life, as we mentioned this morning, and he had accumulated and had everything and had done everything. He looked back over his life and he said, it's what? Vanity of vanities. But that queen thought enough of Solomon to travel all that way, uninvited, to come to see him and just to simply observe what was going on in his kingdom. And Jesus said to his generation, there is one greater than Solomon right here, and you reject my wisdom. You have no interest in my wisdom. Jesus takes the name, the Word of God. I'm not telling you that the, the Bible is Jesus, but God's Word is an expression of who He is, and that's why God's Word is so important. And that's why Jesus calls Himself the Word, because He is God, and He is an express image of God. You have in your lap the wisdom of God. Young person, look at me and listen to me. If you reject this, if you refuse this, that queen would rise up in judgment of you and she would say, what are you doing? I traveled all that distance to hear from Solomon, a flawed man, but a man who had the wisdom of God. And you have the wisdom of God's word in your lap. Why would you think that you could get by with sin? Why would you think that you could get by violating the wisdom of God and going against it? Why would you think that it would be any different for you? Why would we think as a society that we could turn from the Word of God and the truth of God and it be okay? Why would we think that we could turn from the wisdom of God regarding the home and the family unit and what that's supposed to look like and it be all, all work out? Why would we think in the order and the structure of our life that we can go any way we choose to go opposite of God and it not end in total disaster? This is wisdom. Jesus said to that generation, listen, there is a, someone greater than Jonah here. There's someone wiser than Solomon. There's a greater sign than Jonah in the belly of the whale. There's the sign of Jesus in the grave and three days later, the resurrection. And that's a sign to all of us, isn't it? That is the ultimate sign of repentance, to turn to God, that only God can save you and that only through Jesus Christ is there salvation. And there's wisdom. And I feel like sometimes the preachers have got to beg you and plead with you and wrap it up and dip it in chocolate to try to get people into God's Word. 
We grow up in church and we grow up around the Bible and it's, you know, it's a part of our life. It's there, but are we really in the Bible? And better yet, is the Bible really in us? The Bible speaks of decency and morality and purity and holiness and how we live our lives and how we present ourselves and how we carry ourselves. It's so much more than just somebody harping at you. It's the Word of God and the wisdom of God. Hey, it matters. What one generation does, another follows, and oftentimes they take it to a whole other level. There's wisdom in not being a stumbling block to others. There are some things that are lawful for me, but they're not expedient. They don't help me. They don't help my testimony. And they certainly don't help those that would follow after me. And we have dropped stumbling block after stumbling block in front of the next generation. Just as you would not allow your child to be in a situation where there's unsafe positions. We go in the nursery and you know, we put outlet plugs in because we don't want some youngster to stick his finger in there. We have baby gates that are up behind in the baptistry area and stretched across when we're not using the baptistry because we would never want a little one to be able to get into the baptistry and fall in. We have safety measures on our buses. We have safety measures everywhere we go. We put them in seat belts. We put them in car seats. And car seats now cost more than my first car cost. I was riding around in the back window of a car when I was a kid, you know, laying in the, you know, basically a hatchback, riding in the trunk. And I wanted to ride in the trunk. Remember the cool old station wagons where you could sit in the back and face out back, right? Just so when you get rear-ended, you're right there taking all the hit, right? <laughs> I mean, we go to all these measures, you know. When I was a kid, we didn't wear helmets to ride our bikes. We didn't put elbow pads and knee pads on, and, and we made it. <laughs> right? We survived. And how, man, we're strapping people down. We're putting gear on them. Why? We wanted to be safe. And yet we... Where's real safety? Bring, brought, brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, being taught to honor our parents, being taught to be obedient. You can save that melon from getting cracked. But if you fill that melon full of evolution and all this other nonsense, what was the reason in protecting it to begin with? Now you say, preacher, are you against my child wearing a helmet? I, I think they need it. Get them a helmet, man. Well, you're missing the point. The point is... What are we really concerned about? Are we really interested in protecting children? We spend all of our time protecting this. When we, we ought to be protecting is this and this. Because this is who you are, not this. That's wisdom. And Jesus said, this generation, there's a, I've got more. I, I'm the one who gave Solomon wisdom. Why don't you talk to me about this? And then he likened them to something. He likened them, look at it with me, Matthew chapter 12. And I've got to hurry up here. Matthew chapter 12, he likened them to a person who has been inhabited by an unclean spirit. Notice verse 43. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. You know, there's several things in the Bible, and I'm not for time's sake go through all of them, but there's about eight different facts regarding unclean spirits that you can see in the Scripture. Particular places they like to go, particular things that they're apparently involved with. They, like, they go to high places. It's oftentimes talks about how the demon-possessed fellow went up into the mountains. They took Jesus to a high place or something about that. It's something about wet places. By the way, man is 80% water. There was that child that was, uh, had that unclean spirit that would come upon him. He would throw himself into water and he would throw himself into fire. That's some interesting things. Uh, unclean spirits are linked to people cutting themselves and hurting themselves, marking themselves. Unclean spirits are linked to people taking their clothes off. It bears out throughout the scripture. And what, what has become of our society? We're a marked up, messed up crowd who never seems to blush about anything anymore, right? 
cotton picking, man, people go to Walmart in their pajamas. It doesn't get any goofier than that, right? You know, I'm, I see a full grown man wearing his pajamas to Walmart and his bunny slippers. I'm not going shopping anymore. It's too discouraging. Huh? And, and look at us. Look at what we've become as a society. Look what's becoming our norm, increasingly defacing and defaming the body that God has given us. I, I think there's, pretty safe to say, there's devilish activity. We got all kinds of names for it, and we like to put a term to it, but friend, I. We got spiritual warfare and that spiritual wickedness. There's stuff going on. And the Bible talks about this particular generation as if they were a person who had an unclean spirit coming in him. Look what the Bible says. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into. That's, this is a, an interesting statement. You're, you're hearing the conversation of an unclean spirit. You're hearing the thoughts of an unclean spirit. He says, I will return into what? My house. Isn't that interesting when you think of what the Bible teaches in the book of Corinthians? What? Know ye not that your body is the what? It's a temple. When you got saved, when you got born again, if you're saved, I mean, I'm not talking about that you believe that there's a God and you believe that there's a Jesus, but there's been a time in your life where you recognize you're as lost as can be. There was in your heart a conviction for sin that I'm going to hell and I need a Savior, and the only one that can save me is Jesus Christ. And I don't know how to make that any plainer. I know in my life, as a junior high boy, the light bulb came on, the Holy Spirit moved to my heart, whatever, however you choose to phrase it. And I knew, like those people that listened to Jonathan Edwards that we referenced a moment ago when he would stand and read a written sermon about sinners in the hands of an angry God. One time he was reading that and he was talking about hell and the reality of hell. And people in that assembly were so moved by that, they were holding on to the columns and the pillars of the church screaming out in repentance wanting to be saved because they felt like they were being held over hell. And I know that as a junior high boy, when I, my pastor preached on the wheats and the tares, and he gave an invitation, I knew something, friend. I knew that I was as lost as could be. I knew the Romans rode forward and backward. I could have told you how to be saved, but I wasn't saved. And that evening, the Lord saved me. And I went from being a churchgoer and being religious to being born again. Now you say, preacher, I don't know that I, that I have that. Well, then you need to be seeking the Lord in that matter. And that's what had happened in my life up to that. There was an unsettling in there. Now, I'm not trying to scare you into uh, not being saved, but if I can scare you into not being saved, we need to talk about that so you can have some confidence in that. You're going to struggle all in your life and all throughout your time in Christ. You're going to struggle if you're not secure in knowing what it means to be saved. This is not an in and out church. If you're in, you're in. Because what brought you in is the Lord Jesus Christ, and He's the one that's going to seal you and keep you in and protect you, and you can't get out. Amen. Well, so I don't know that I'm in, then we need to talk about that. If you sit here, if you sit in this church, you say, I don't know that you can know that. That's not what the Bible teaches. You can know that. And if you don't know that, we need to help you to get solid in that. The Bible says that this. Unclean spirit says, I'm going back to what? My house. And when he gets there, remember now, the Lord's talking about this generation who would not repent and who would not take the wisdom of the Lord. And when he has come, he findeth it what? Empty. Nobody living there. Vacant. That means the Holy Spirit's not living there. There's nothing there. It's there it's, that's that spiritual death. That's that emptiness there. He finds it empty, but he finds that it's been swept and what? Garnished. Been cleaned up. Looks good. How did we get here? He said, Preacher, what's this got to do with America? This is, has everything to do with who we are. We have taken the name of God and we put the name of God on things. And I believe that there were people who were born again, but a lot of folks came along for the ride. There's a lot of people who sing God bless America and don't believe any more in God than they do the man in the moon. They don't know the God of the Bible. They'll say things like this. Well, there are many gods. No, there's one God. 
It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe something. No, that's not true. That's not reality. It does matter what you believe. They say we can all get along. They say doctrine divides. Well, doctrine builds. Doctrine establishes. Doctrine is the foundation. We have to have doctrine. Well, you preach, you, you, why, why can't we get along with everybody? Why can't all groups of people, why can't we coexist? Huh? Why? Jesus himself said it. I am the way. He was very clear. I am the truth. Now look, regardless of what generation you're from, older folks get tired of fighting. Younger folks don't like the embarrassment of people who do fight. But the reality is truth is truth. And we've got to stand with truth and we've got to stand for truth. Well, my personal experience, my personal pain, personally people, I get all that. I understand that sin's bad, sin's ugly, sin touches our lives, sin complicates everybody's lives. But truth is truth and it's got to be preached and it's got to be proclaimed. And that devil comes in, that unclean spirit, and he says, well, looky here, it's still empty but it sure is tidied up. And you know what he does? Well, look and see. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and what? Dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. How did we get here? We got here because we took the name of God, but we were not a born again nation. We've neglected the gospel. We've watered the gospel down. We've been more interested in having people in church than having people in Christ. We've been more interested in keeping people in something, involving people in something than telling them you must be born again. Now I'm for people being in church and I'm for people growing and getting around it but the reality is at some point you got to get in. Because if you're just simply cleaning things up, all you're doing is making a clean, empty house, and the state will be worse with that false sense that that generation had. And we're pretty good. And so we say, God bless America. In God we trust. But do we? Is that really who we are? So what do we do, preacher? I'm glad you asked. We have a problem. We have taken and cleaned things up, but we've not experienced consistently in the lives of folks the new birth, being saved. We must, we must, we must, we must be clear and plain, and we must not be ashamed, and we must proclaim the gospel. You cannot take it when somebody tells you that they go to church that they understand what it is to be saved because many people go to church and take up pew space and don't have a clue about what it is to be born again. When you go to work, you can't be ashamed of this. You can't back off from this. We've got to get the gospel out. It's a call in this generation. There's a call in our country. What difference can we make? The gospel makes the difference. In 1 Timothy, it talks about a group of people and how things would become. And it talks about the fact that they would have a form of godliness, but denying the what? The dunamis, the power thereof. Denying it, refusing it. That's how we can have folks who go and visit with the Pope and be religious and go to church. And we get pictures of our leaders. They, they go into a church somewhere or, or a building they call a church. And they walk out and they're telling us they're going to pray for us and they're going to pray for this and they're going to pray for that. And then turn around and want to pass legislation to crack a baby's skull open and suck its brains out and commit murder against them. How can this be? Lost. Deceived. But a vacuum there where one evil spirit says, hey boys, come on in. And our nation has had an open door. And I'm disappointed. It hurts for me because as a person who has seen it one way and now we see what it's becoming, we realize the door is open. What do we do? We've got to now more than ever take the sword of the Spirit, salvation, the gospel message. We've got to flood our area, our life, our relationships with an understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ.
We cannot assume, we cannot presume that people know the Lord. We've got to get the gospel to folks. Number two, there are those who have cleaned up the house, but only to open it up for further damage. But then there are those who are in the Spirit, we're born of the Spirit, and now we're called to do something. Galatians speaks of this. Now we're called to walk in the Spirit. What is it that saved me? Who is it, if you will? The Holy Spirit. That's the new birth. That's God, that breath of God coming in. The regeneration. There's a lot of terms there, but that's what it is. That's who it is. That's God living in me, the Holy Spirit indwelling me. And now I'm called to walk in Him. What does that look like to walk in the Spirit? Oftentimes in the Scripture that expression to walk is used. It's a description of my life. It's a, it's a description of my daily life. I'm to walk in the Spirit. Because we're walking in the Spirit will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And then there's a list given of what are the works of the flesh. And what does that look like? Young people, I'm calling on you now. Listen, your preacher's speaking to you now. I need you to get this. You need to understand something. You need to walk in the Spirit, not because the pastor, not because your parents want you to, but because it's necessary for your testimony to be effective in your generation, for you to walk in the Spirit, and also for you to have a life that is good, and a life that brings glory to God. You've got to walk in the Spirit. We've got to walk in the Spirit in our homes. We've got to walk in the Spirit in our minds. We've got to be careful what we bring in because this battlefield in the mind and in the heart, this is the playground for the enemy, and this is where the Spirit meets the enemy, and there is that combative nature there to get truth in and to get it in our heart and our lives. And for so, so long now, we've we, we, we've teetered in and out with the world, and we're amused by the world, we're entertained by the world, but there comes that point, as there was on the day of Moses, where a line's got to be drawn, and we've got to be willing to say, I'm on the Lord's side. I choose the Lord. I choose the Word of God. I choose the Spirit of God. I want to walk in the Spirit. And I wonder if we're not just as dead at times as others, or we have a form of something, and perhaps you're saved. But you're denying the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to transform your life into what the Lord wants it to be. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, when talking to his disciples, told them, hey, you're a lamp and you've been lit. What's a lamp have to have in it to burn? Oil. And oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. You got, the, you got saved, the Spirit of God's within you. You've been lit and you're burning now. Nobody lights a lamp to hide it. Nobody lights a lamp and then puts it under a bushel. Particularly in those days, oil was expensive. It was, a, it was a process. They didn't have a light switch to flip on. You light that lamp and you take it and you put it in the middle of the house. You light up the room. You illuminate. You use it for its purposes. And in this generation, we've got to burn bright for the Lord. We've got to. We've got to learn to walk in the Spirit. Why? Well, in this generation, we are those called people and that peculiar people in a, a royal priesthood called in this generation to shine forth. Your children need you to do that. Your grandchildren, I, you say, preacher, the Lord's coming back, and because He's coming back, well, I believe He's coming back. But there's some things to take place between now and then. And a part of that's your stewardship of what you've been given. When I believe coming out of college at 21, 22, man, the Lord's coming back. And I still believe the Lord's coming back. He's coming back in His timing. He's not late. He's on His schedule. Until then, though, I want your children and your grandchildren to know truth, to know salvation to know service, to have a life that's good, a life that's good by God's standard, and a life that brings glory to God. Why? Because there's a time appointed unto man to die. And what a tragedy it would be for anybody around us in our sphere of our lives to not know Christ. And what a tragedy it would be for us to miss our opportunity in our generation. So Jesus said to that generation, what? There's one greater than Jonas, Jonah. There's one wiser than Solomon. And here's what you've become. 
This generation, you're like a, a house that was empty with an unclean spirit in it. And you've cleaned up everything. When that unclean spirit leaves and he comes back, he looks and he says, oh, there's still nobody living here. Hey, boys, come on in. And he said to that generation, you'll be basically seven times worse because you've heard the truth, you've rejected the truth, and you've left yourself open to all sorts of satanic attack and influence. How did we get here? Truth. And not responding to it. It breaks my heart to see where people who have been exposed to truth but have not followed it, not responded to it. At times, the tragic consequences in their life. I don't want that for you. How it must have broken the heart of the people in Samson's day to see their hero and that young man with so much promise and so much opportunity blinded, mocked, grinding at the mill like an animal. Huh? How it must have broken their hearts. And how it breaks the hearts of those that have taught and proclaimed truth to folks to watch folks turn from it only to begin to find out that the consequences of the rejection of truth are oftentimes an open door to greater problems. Don't turn from it. Respond to it. Repent. When you're wrong, make it right. Here's wisdom. Get it. Follow it. And you make sure this evening that that house is not empty. You make sure that the Spirit of God is within you. If you're sitting here tonight and you say, Preacher, I don't know that I'm saved. Please don't leave here tonight without at least allowing someone to help you to talk to you about that. You say, but I know everything about being saved. Hold on a second. Do you know that you know? We'll say it this way, that Jesus lives in your heart. Do you know that? If you don't, let's get it squared away this evening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now, please. Father in heaven, thank you for this time. We could commit to the study of your word and the preaching of your word. Lord, a lot of things there to deal with and to approach, but just very simply, this matter of repentance, this matter of wisdom, this matter of emptiness in that house. How did we get here? A failure to repent. A failure to heed the wisdom of God. A cleaning up on the outside, but an emptiness on the inside, leaving a vacuum and an opening. Our heads bowed, our eyes are closed. Who's here this evening? You say, Preacher, I don't know that I'm saved. I'm sitting here and I'm hearing the gospel talked and impressed and the need for it. I have concerns about that. I, you, you know, you, preacher, you talk about being saved, and I, I kind of get worked up over it. I don't know that. I don't have that confidence. But I'd like to know that, or I want you to pray for me, preacher, that I would understand that and be solid in that. You say, Pastor, that's me. I don't know that I'm saved. Could I pray for you tonight? Would you lift your hand? Is there anybody like that this evening? You say, preacher, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. Is there a teenager, a young person tonight? Who's here this evening? Say, Preacher, I know that I'm saved. I know that the Holy Spirit of God indwells me. I know that. Would you raise your hand? Now, friend, could I ask you two things? Would you pray for our country? Try to help you have a bit, little bit of understanding of why we're where we're at. And number two, could I ask you this? Would you give yourself to walk in the Spirit? Would you recognize that great battle and that great struggle? of yielding to the Holy Spirit, who would say, Preacher, there was something in that for me tonight, and the Lord is working in my heart. Would you lift your hand? Anybody like that? I might pray with you. Well, I'm not giving up in my generation. I'm not giving up on things. I'm going to continue to push forward for the Lord, just as Paul did as he was in his generation, just as Christ did in his generation. We're called in our generation to do the same thing. Let's not give up. Let's not quit. Let's not throw in the towel. Let's trust the Lord. Let's walk in the Spirit. Let's be a witness. Who would say this tonight? Preacher, I need to be more in tune in getting the gospel out. I need to be more in tune with that. I need to be more involved in that. Would you lift your hand? I might, I might pray for you. That's a decision for all of us, isn't it? So important, isn't it? The gospel. Father, I hope that you'll just work in our hearts and that you'll seal decisions, Lord, that you'll make it so in our lives. Could we have a time of invitation? I would feel out of sorts to preach something with these points and not spend some time with the Lord. Maybe it's a matter of correction. Maybe there's something going on in your heart tonight, and the Lord is just, as He has done in my life many times, He is just absolutely knocking at the door of your heart, saying, you're wrong in this area. You know you're wrong. You're going in the wrong direction. It's not going to end well. Turn around. 
come back to me in that manner. Maybe it's a matter of wisdom. Maybe it's a matter of salvation or being a witness. I don't know how the Lord would lead you, but I trust that as He does, you'll respond to Him. There's not a one of us that's too young to make decisions for the Lord, and there's not a one of us that's too old to make decisions for the Lord. As long as we have life and breath, we ought to be wholly giving ourselves to following Him and pursuing His purposes in our lives. So stand on our feet, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll ask the penis to play for just a few moments. The altar is open this evening. There are folks that have moved towards the altar, and we invite you to do the same. You come as the Lord would lead you. You respond to Him. Maybe there's some young people tonight that you say, Boy, you know what, preacher? It's time for me to stop messing around on this. It's time for me to get serious about serving the Lord. I was about 16, 17 years old when I committed to get busy for the Lord and to be surrendered in that and genuine and sincere in that effort. The altar is open and folks are still moving in this direction. Let's respond to the leadership of the Lord. I cannot express it plainly enough. There were times in my life as a young person where God dealt with my heart that I was heading in a wrong direction. And I, I knew I have got to listen to him. I've got to follow his wisdom. And that's that understanding of who he is and his emphasis. You know, when we don't follow him, when we don't turn to him, we don't correct things as he brings in correction to our life. We open ourselves up to greater damage and harm. He loves us, he's good to us, and that's why he deals with us, like a father with his children. Whom the Lord loveth, he what? He chasteneth and scourgeth like a son, he deals with them. I think of when he came to Cain, and Cain wouldn't offer the right thing, and what did the Lord say to him? Cain, if thou doest well, I'm working with you, Cain, I'm trying to help you out here, I'm trying to get you on track here, Cain, you know what you're supposed to do here in this matter, come on, Cain. God is merciful that way. When God's dealing with you, don't, don't refuse Him and don't push Him away. Respond. Lord, thank you for a good day in the Lord's house and for the Word of God, Lord, the truth. Lord, may it be help, helpful in each of our lives. May we make application, and Lord, may we have direction and correction, certainly, Lord, in each of our lives. And we'll certainly thank you for it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Two meetings we need to have tonight. Those who signed up to work in Vacation Bible School and those who are interested but did not sign up, you can stick around for this meeting. We'll meet right here. And then Brother Anthony would like to meet with those who are looking for information regarding youth conference, which is coming up next week. So we've got two things going on. Brother Anthony's meeting will start in five minutes. Let me do my VBS meeting first. And so if you're involved in both, come to the VBS meeting first, and then we'll go from there. Hey, ice cream is ready, and we need you to eat it all. We can leave none behind. There can be no 